What makes Seventh-day Adventist education distinctive? While there are many distinguishing features, these merge into a single defining construct, the philosophy of Adventist education. At first glance, Colossians 2.8 seems perplexing. Beware, lest anyone spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit. It would appear as if philosophy of itself may be off-limits. Philosophy, however, is but a set of ideas about how to do something or how to live. It is derived from the Greek philosophia, which in literal terms meant love of wisdom. The problem, then, is not in having a set of guiding principles about how we conduct education, nor is it in seeking after wisdom. After all, Scripture reminds us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. The problem, as Paul points out, is from where we obtain that set of ideas. It is where we head in our search for wisdom. He adds, Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. In essence, one can formulate and implement a God-centered philosophy of education, or one can strike God from the equation and adhere to a secular approach, whether through a traditional or contemporary philosophy of education. Therein, the danger. It is vital that we as educators truly understand the philosophy of Adventist education. Ellen White affirms, teachers need to become acquainted with true philosophy. And where can this be found? More perfect and complete than in the Word of God. This Word opens a sure path in which our feet can travel with safety. Consequently, Seventh-day Adventist educational philosophy is based on the bedrock of Scripture. It is also guided by the writings of Ellen White, particularly in works such as the book Education. Based on these sources, we will highlight seven key components which serve as essential elements of an Adventist philosophy of education. At creation, human beings were formed in God's image after His likeness. Being created in God's image, Imago Dei, provides us with the capacity to love, the ability to relate and communicate, the aptitude to administrate, and the facility for creativity, decision-making, and rational thought. Consequently, when we make a friend, hug a child, name a pet, paint a portrait, or send a text message, we proclaim that we are made in God's likeness. The foremost feature of the image of God, however, is found in our spiritual and moral nature. We can, in fact, communicate, develop relationships, exert leadership, and evidence creativity. But unless these are guided by moral values derived from God's character, the result will not be godlike. Consider, for example, dominion, the ability to govern. The manner of our rule, whether self-serving or focused on selfless service, is ultimately of greater consequence than the mere fact of our rule. Our God-given abilities, then, are not ends in themselves. Rather, they provide us 
with the capacity to make moral decisions and to live moral lives. Consequently, it is in the moral realm, in character, where the image of God is most clearly revealed. Scripture states that we have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and that the Lord restores our soul. Why are redemption and restoration necessary? Included in the Imago Dei is volition, the ability to make decisions. This freedom of choice includes the ability to love or not to love, to trust or to distrust. It includes the ability to choose good or evil, godliness or ungodliness. Tragically, the first human beings distrusted the Creator and chose to reject a relationship with God. As a result, we fall short of the glory of God. We begin to lose the likeness to our Creator, and the image of God becomes distorted and deformed. The good news is that restoration is possible. How does it happen? Paul points out that by looking to Jesus, by contemplating his life and teachings, we are changed into his likeness. This restoration brings about a reformation in our lives, a metamorphosis in which old things are passed away and all things are become new. Ellen White affirms that the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. Consequently, the image of God component of the philosophy of education highlights the purpose of Adventist education and leads us to the following implications. First, students are God's creation and thereby possess inherent value. Second, as educators, we are to express in our lives the attributes of God. And third, Adventist education is to lift up Jesus, that students may see who God truly is and be transformed into his likeness. Luke 2.52 states that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This multifaceted growth incorporated four crucial dimensions, intellectual, physical, spiritual, and social development. Similarly, Owen White, in the opening paragraphs of the book Education, wrote, that true education is the harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual powers. She then adds that such a learning experience prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come, emphasizing the socio-emotional component. Whole person development describes the product of Adventist education. In the mental arena, the educational experience is to impart wisdom, a correct application of knowledge, to glorify God and bless those around us. It is to contribute toward high-level thinking, analysis, evaluation, and creative thought and action. Fundamentally, it seeks to frame a biblical worldview, where each aspect 
of life and learning is viewed through the biblical lens, endeavoring to understand the discipline and its applications as God sees them. The physical component incorporates a healthy lifestyle, a solid work ethic, and recreation, a change in routine that contributes toward restoring the image of God. The spiritual focus incorporates Bible study, the development of a personal and corporate relationship with God, and the formation of moral character. The social dimension features service, witness, and orienting life and vocation as a response to the divine calling. In all, a harmonious development that prepares the student for life here and in the world to come. This key concept provides several implications. First, students are to experience whole person development in each educational level. Second, as educators, we are to incorporate key spiritual, physical, and social outcomes throughout the program of studies in a balanced approach with cognitive competencies. And third, missional experiences and service learning are to be hallmarks of Adventist education. Scripture makes it clear. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. The Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. God, then, is the source of truth, revealing true facts and principles through Scripture, through His created works in the physical world and in human society, and through the creative and reflective thought processes. Each of these, however, must point toward and function in harmony with its source. Among these, we must recognize Scripture as the clearest and most comprehensive revelation of God's truth. The role of the Word in the teaching learning process is highlighted throughout the Bible. David declared, the teaching of your Word gives light. And Christ prayed, sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. What then is the place of the Bible in Adventist education? It is not to be a slice of the curriculum, one subject among many competing for the student's time and attention. Rather, the Word of God is to be core to every subject area. Ellen White underscores the role of Scripture as the great unifying factor in the program of studies. The Bible should be made the foundation of study and of teaching. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, states it this way, I am very much afraid that the universities will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the holy scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not unceasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Recognizing God as the source of all truth is a sustaining paradigm in Adventist education and leads us 
to the following implications. First, students should interact personally with God's Word in each subject area. Second, as educators, we are to intentionally connect all knowledge to its source. And third, Adventist education is to make the Word of God the foundation of all academic endeavor. Perhaps from the Gnostics of ancient Greece, we have inherited the problem of dualistic thinking. We create false dichotomies. Love versus authority. Mercy versus justice. Theory as opposed to practice. And student versus subject. The most problematic, however, is the spiritual secular divide, in which we label some aspects of life as spiritual, such as attendance at religious services and personal devotions, while we consider the rest as secular, without reference to God or His plan for our lives. The same dualism can enter education, where the religion course, the week of prayer, or a devotional thought is viewed as spiritual. And then we get on with the rest of learning from a secular frame of reference. Scripture, however, holds that a spiritual perspective is to pervade all. Whether, therefore, you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul further affirms that we are to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. A program of studies is made up of courses, which are comprised of topics, which consist of concepts. If all thoughts acknowledge the Lordship of Christ, this means that all concepts, topics, courses, and in fact the entire educational program must recognize that Jesus is Lord. A comprehensive, spirit-filled perspective then lies at the heart of Christian life and learning. Paul writes, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, where Christ is all and is in all. Notice that the restoration of the image of God involves a renewal of the mind, of our view of life and learning. Let this mind, this attitude, this perspective be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In this vein, Ellen White reminds educators, Bible religion is not to be like a dash of color brushed here and there upon the canvas, but its influence is to pervade the whole life, as though the canvas were dipped into the color until every thread of the fabric was dyed a deep, fast, unfading hue. The implications of the overarching spiritual perspective include the following. First, as Christians, we must think Christianly. Second, the biblical worldview brings a unified approach to life and learning, precluding a spiritual, secular dichotomy. And third, as educators, we must ensure 
that a spiritual focus frames each academic subject and topic. In Scripture, faith, learning, and life are linked. Paul declares, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith, then, is connected to learning about God and His plan for our lives. This is essential, but insufficient. Faith must also link to life. As James asserts, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This faith integrative process in learning and life is itself anchored in the Word of God. We will briefly consider these elements. Faith. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Faith is trust in something or in someone. There are three key dimensions. First, faith in God, both knowing about God and knowing Him experientially. Second, faith in the divine revelation, trust in God's message and confidence in the divine plan. And perhaps the more difficult at times, faith in persons, in the potential of others and of ourselves by God's grace. Learning. Jesus declared, Come to me and learn from me. There are two essential aspects in this process. First, learning to think Christianly, a change in mind. And second, learning to live by faith, a change of life. Life. Jesus announced, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This abundant life is a meaningful life and an eternal life. It provides focus and direction in our lives. And the eternal dimension begins as we accept Christ as Savior. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What then is the unity of faith, learning, and life? It is when biblical beliefs and values provide the bedrock for the academic endeavor, which in turn seeks to relate Christianity to the full range of the human experience. It is more than just a mixture or a chance encounter. It is when faith is the great integrating factor of all learning and life. Nurturing faith, then, is the integrative process in the philosophy of Adventist education. Ellen White wrote, The students in our schools and all our youth should be given an education that will strengthen them in the faith. This faith-affirming focus leads to the following implications. Students must personally experience faith developed through a relationship with God. Second, teachers are to nurture faith, seeking a transformation in both mind and life. And third, an overarching goal of Adventist education is to form persons who trust God's plan for their lives. 
The Paracletos is the promise of Adventist education. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Ephesians 4 reminds us that Spirit-filled teaching is a divine gift granted to prepare God's people for works of service and to edify the body of Christ in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. In Adventist education, teachers must be competent, demonstrating solid content knowledge and effective teaching skills, serving as caring mentors and committed to professional growth. While competence is vital, it is nonetheless insufficient to accomplish the task of Christian education. Just as the earth is surrounded by a life-giving atmosphere, so competence must be enveloped in commitment. The concept of commitment is biblical. Paul writes to Timothy, The things that you have heard from me, commit these to faithful witnesses, who will be able to teach others also. Jesus further clarified that a faithful and wise servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his household. Ellen White affirms, It is not enough that the teacher possess natural ability and intellectual culture. These are indispensable, but without a spiritual fitness for the work, he is not prepared to engage in it. He should see every pupil as the handiwork of God, a candidate for immortal honors. And we are promised, just as surely as the educators of the youth are consecrated to God, so surely will their efforts be crowned with success in this life and the future life. Such commitment involves wholehearted consecration to God and to fulfilling the mission that He has entrusted. It includes dedication to the salvation of our students, faithfulness to the biblical worldview, and devotion to a life of witness and service. It means that we seek to represent the Master. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. In sum, Adventist educators are to be spirit-filled, both competent and committed. This unified responsibility is to be our personal priority. Further, the integrated elements of competence and commitment are to guide the institution in the process of hiring, in nurturing the continued growth of its staff, and throughout the personnel assessment process. Some implications. First, the Holy Spirit is essential to the success of the teaching-learning experience. Second, as educators, we are to view our profession as a divine calling focused on the salvation of our students. Third, Christian educators are to be 
faithful as God's representatives. Sometimes, as educators, we adopt a restricted vision of what students can become and focus largely on helping students pass the subject or on seeking to ensure that they can graduate. At times, that vision is expanded by endeavoring to prepare students to be successful in the broader context of life, in their professions, in their relationship with friends and family, and as responsible citizens. Adventist education, however, envisions a broader scope, educating for eternity. The concept of education with a view of eternity is embedded in Scripture. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. But how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Believing then depends on hearing the word. And hearing is contingent upon one who shares the word. The true science of education, Ella White wrote, will fit the youth for eternal life. To this end, she encouraged teachers, educate as for eternity. Salvation is to be at the heart of the Adventist philosophy of education. The great teacher calls for every youth to learn the true philosophy of education. What shall I do to be saved? Consequently, the ultimate priority of Seventh-day Adventist education is to prepare the student as a candidate for heaven. Because a godlike character is the only asset that we can take from this world to the next, character formation is key in Adventist schools. Ellen White asserts that the education and training of the youth is an important and solemn work. The great object to be secured should be the proper development of character, that the individual may be fitted to rightly discharge the duties of the present life and to enter at last upon the future immortal life. Biblical values lay the foundation for the formation of moral character. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These values form the basis for moral reasoning. Teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. The priority of educating for eternity provides us with implications for Adventist education. First, every student is to understand the true philosophy of education. Second, as educators, we are to see our students as God sees them, candidates of heaven. And third, Adventist education must prioritize character formation based on moral values derived from God's character. 
The philosophy of education, described in scripture and delineated in the writings of Ellen White, provides distinctive traits of Seventh-day Adventist education. This educational philosophy enables us to clearly define the purpose, product, paradigm, perspective, process, promise, and priority of Adventist education. These elements, in turn, are essential in carrying forward the Divine Commission through the Ministry of Education, with a clear understanding and implementation vital for each one who forms a part of this endeavor. This leads us to a personal choice. To paraphrase the words of Joshua 24.15, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of traditional education that your mentors served, or the gods of this secular age in which you now live. May our commitment be. But as for me and my classroom, as for me and my school, we will serve the Lord.